Good evening. Glad to have everyone here tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad you're here. We encourage you to come back whenever you have that opportunity. A couple announcements before our service begins. Jimmy Fleetwood, who is the brother of Faye McCurdy, he was injured last week when he was attacked by a dog. So there is a, his address is posted on the bulletin board out there if you could like to send him a card. He would appreciate that. Brooke Michael began radiation last week to treat her leukemia. So let's remember that good family. And Joe Serpico, who is Ray McCullough's brother-in-law, passed away yesterday. So I think Ray is there, so let's remember that family. Monday night for the Master is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And there's a congregational cookout April 24th at Linda Meadows' house. Fun, fun and games start at 4. Eating hot dogs starts at 6. Sign up on the bulletin board if you would, please. Thank you. Dear Lord God and Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this beautiful day. We thank you for loving us and caring for us and watching over us. We thank you for allowing us to be together once again to worship and praise you. We pray that everything we say and do here today glorifies your name. We pray that you bless those who can't be with us today. We, if they are traveling, please watch over them, bring, us, bring them back to us safely. Those who are uh, suffering in any way, those who may be sick or injured or facing surgery, we pray that you bless them with comfort and allow us to uh, minister to them in some way. Please bless those who, uh, all those who serve here, the elders and deacons, the uh, teachers and, and other ministers, we pray that you bless them and their families and their efforts that we may grow in the knowledge of your son and uh, grow closer to you each day. We thank you so much for uh, being with us now as we study and worship. We pray that you bless us in this hour, and we love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
song for the lesson will be Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Scripture this evening will be Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And other angels he saith, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter 
of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. And there are certain matters in the Bible where we have a lot of curiosity and the Bible is not designed to satisfy every curiosity we have. And I dare say that that's going to be the case with our subject tonight. Whereas we talk about what the Bible says concerning angels, we're going to walk away saying, I wish I had a little more information. In the sense that we're curious, but not in the sense that we blame God for having revealed too little to us for our faith and practice. Because remember, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that Scripture is sufficient for our faith and practice. It's given so that we might be fully equipped for everything that we need to do in order to live a righteous life. We have, in the first century already, the Christians had all things pertaining to life and godliness. That is, they had the Christian system fully revealed to them, even if their every curiosity remained, in many cases, unsatisfied. So we're going to talk about angels tonight, and there are certain things that men have believed about angels that are just not true. At least they have no biblical support for those positions. For example, some have thought of angels as being women, and yet the Bible never portrays an angel as being in the female presentation. Of course, angels are spiritual beings, as Hebrews 1 and verse 14 says, so we would not press gender upon an angel in either way. They're neither married nor given in marriage, Matthew twenty-two thirty 30 says. But at the same time, whenever an angel appears, he's presented in the masculine. And then some have thought that angels played harps, and the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Some have thought that angels wore halos, but the Bible doesn't say anything about that. I think that comes from medieval artistic presentations of angels. Some have thought that human beings transform into angels somehow at the day of judgment or maybe when they die they turn into angels, but there's no support for that in the Bible. Rather, angels are always presented as being a different class of being. That is, God has created angels on the one hand, but then he's also created humans on the other hand, and there's no sense that angels ever turn into humans or that humans ever turn into angels. The Bible says that angels have been involved in some great events throughout history. This is a partial list on the screen of passages that demonstrate angels have been involved in bringing about amazing historical events. For example, angels destroyed Sodom, according to Genesis chapter 19 and verse 13, or they were involved in bringing it about. Angels destroyed 70,000 Israelites. There was an angel of death that was sent upon Israel as a punishment for David having numbered the people in 2 Samuel 24. In 2 Kings 19 and verse 35, a single angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, just essentially wiped out the Assyrian army in that part of the world in one night. Amazing the power demonstrated by an angel on that occasion. In Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, we read about angels receiving word from God about the punishment of the wicked Jews in Jerusalem. Similarly, in Psalm 78, we read about angels uh, being involved in the bringing about of the plagues on Egypt. Psalm 78 and verse 49 is where a, a host of angels were, it appears, assigned with the task of bringing that about. So God operates in many cases, has operated in history through the ministry of angels. When we turn over to the New Testament, we find in Matthew 1 and in Luke chapter 1 an angel announcing the birth of Jesus and the birth of John the Baptist. We find in Matthew 4 and verse 11 that after Jesus was tempted by the devil, angels came and ministered to him. So here are angels doing a variety of marvelous works. In Matthew 28, verses 2 through 5, it was an angel who rolled away the stone from the tomb. In the book of Acts, we find an angel releasing Peter and the other apostles from prison. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 12. We find in Acts 8, 26, it was an angel who called 
Philip away from a very successful gospel meeting he was having in Samaria so that he could go and preach the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch on the road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza, which is desert. An angel told him exactly where to go in order to accomplish that. And then as we look forward in history to the judgment day, we find in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 and 8, that when Jesus comes in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel, that his holy angels will be coming with him. So here's just a brief summary of some of the great things that angels have done throughout history. But tonight I would like to make some general statements about things that angels have done and things that we can know about angels. Briefly, I'm going to discuss 10 things we can know from the Bible about angels. And maybe you've thought about all of these before. This may be total review, but there might be one or two on the list that you haven't considered, at least not in this type of a context. Before we go into that list, I would like to remind you that the Greek Greek word for angel, angelos, and the Hebrew word for angel, malach, Both refer to messengers in their general usage. In fact, both the Hebrew word for angel in the Old Testament and the Greek word for angel in the New Testament are used to denote plain old, everyday messengers. For example, in 1 Samuel 23, 27, an angel, that is in the generic sense of the word, a messenger, came and told Saul that there was an invasion in another part of the country, so he left pursuing David and let David go, at least for the time being, because of what a messenger told him. Well, a messenger, in this case, is not the angel in the way that we usually use the word to refer to that class of spiritual beings from heaven, but rather just a human messenger. Same word. So we have to always look at the context and see, are we talking about a human messenger or are we talking about a person of a particular angelic host in heaven? Or we might look at Luke chapter 7, for example, where messengers are sent from John the Baptist to Jesus to ask him some questions. Remember when John was in prison, this is also in Matthew chapter 11. When John was in prison, he apparently became very discouraged and started asking some questions about Jesus that normally he would not have asked because he had been preaching the answers to the questions that he was asking. But it's possible for even faithful preachers to have questions about what they're preaching. And they need to look to the Bible, look to the evidence, and get the answers for what they're preaching. But here John the Baptist was having some doubts, and so he sent messengers to Jesus to ask him how to resolve these doubts. And the messengers took the word back from Jesus. Well, that word for messenger in Luke chapter 7 is angelos. It's the word angel. But again, there's a generic sense of that word angel and the specific sense to refer to that class of heavenly beings or members of the heavenly host. And that's the sense in which we're going to be talking about it tonight, that heavenly spiritual sense of an angel. So what can we know about them? Number one, they are created beings. Colossians chapter 1 says that everything in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, was created by Christ. And you probably have already turned to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read together Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7. Ryan just read this for us a moment ago, but let's read it considering the fact that angels are created beings. And of the angels, he says, that is God says, from Psalm 104 and verse 4, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, so who made the angels according to this verse? God made them. That means they were created. They're not eternal. That is, they had a beginning point. God made them. Now look at verse 8 as we contrast the fact that angels were created with the fact that the Son of God is uncreated. But of the Son, not of the angels, but of the Son, he says, and this is Psalm 45, verse 6. And by the way, the Psalms are quoted regularly in the book of Hebrews. If you want a very interesting study of the Psalms, read how the Hebrews writer utilizes the Psalms to comment on the comparison between the old law and the new law. But look at Hebrews 1.8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So that's the first thing we need to observe. Unlike the Son of God, angels were created. 
Then in the second place, angels were created before the world was created. And for this, we go to Job chapter 38, verses 6 and 7. And in this passage, Job is commenting about the foundation of the world. And the comment there is that on that occasion, the stars of the morning shouted for joy, and all of the sons of God, well, the stars of the morning sang, the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid. Well, obviously, we must be talking about angels in that passage, the sons of God, because the human beings had not yet been created. When God created the world, there were no men, because remember, men were formed from the dust of the ground. Adam was formed from the dust of the ground, and then Eve was taken from Adam's rib. So mankind was made by God from the earth. These sons of God, so-called, in Job 38, were created prior to the foundation of of the world. When the foundation of the world was laid, when its bases were sunk and the cornerstone was laid, Job says, these sons of God shouted for joy. So that's the second thing we observe. They were created before the foundation of the world. Now in the third place, notice that the angels are greater than people. This is that they are spiritual beings. They're not limited by a physical body. Let's see what the Hebrews writer says in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Now, here's a quotation of Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5. The verse says, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. So, mankind has a position. Where is that position? In terms of the rank of beings. There's God, and then these spiritual beings he created, the angels, and then a little lower than that is mankind. And we could speculate somewhat, we could make scriptural speculations as to what is under consideration here about why mankind is lower than the angels. One would surely be that these beings are not limited by the physical body limitations that we have. There are many things we can't do because we can only extend ourselves so far in space. I have a certain wingspan, and that's as far as I can go. And I can see a certain distance out there, but just because I have a human eye and not a better eye, I can only see so far out in the distance. I can only run so fast. I can't be here and then very quickly be somewhere else. It takes time to get there. All of these types of things. Those are physical limitations that angels don't have. But in addition, it may be that when angels do all the mighty works they do, they have a power that inheres in them and is less derivative than the miraculous power that mankind has had. I would just give you that as food for thought, and you can study the Bible more on what, that, what the Bible teaches on that. But think about the fact that Peter and Andrew and James and John and the apostles, the Christians at Corinth, the Christians at Ephesus, the Christians all over the world were just plain old people, plain old human beings until God gave them miraculous powers and seems to have granted to them the opportunity to work those miraculous powers on specific occasions. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 discusses how the Holy Spirit gave to each Christian the various gifts, distributed those gifts according to his will. For example, the Apostle Paul could not heal himself of his own thorn in the flesh. So it may be that the angels, when the Hebrews writer says they're higher than humans, it may be that part of what's meant is that they have a power from God that inheres in their very being as angels more than humans' miraculous power has when Paul or Peter or Apollos or one of the men in the first century had miraculous powers. That this was part of what an angel was, and it was something that mankind occasionally got to use. I would just offer that as an idea, and you can study what the Bible says further on that point. Number four, angels are not omniscient. They're not omniscient. There are some things, that is, that they do not know. The other day we had a lesson on God's omniscience, and we said, if I can just remind us, we said that omniscience means that God knows the truth of every true proposition. There is a proposition that God knows about the day of judgment, about the date and time of the judgment, that at least at one time the angels did not know. Because in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, Of that day and hour, here's a truth that God knows. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, nor the angels, nor the Son, but whom? 
but the Father only. I believe Jesus knows the date of the judgment day now, but at least at that time, during his state of humiliation, when he had humbled himself and taken on the form of a servant, he restricted himself from having access to some of the supernatural knowledge that he, as God, had access to. He refused himself the access to that knowledge. And so at that point, he did not have access to the knowledge. And the angels did not have access to that knowledge. So they're not omniscient. There are some things an angel does not know. And we see that again in 1 Peter 1 and verse 12, where Peter's discussing prophecies about Jesus and says, these things have been made known by the Holy Spirit through the prophets that had been sent to the Christians there in the first century. And Peter adds this phrase, things into which angels desire to look. I don't know what is all in that phrase. That's somewhat mysterious phraseology, but at least at some point, angels did not know about the fulfillment of some of the Old Testament prophecies. They wanted to look into those things. They wanted to know more about it, and that would suggest that the angels are not omniscient. Number five, angels do not get married. Remember in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30, as Jesus was having a discussion with the Pharisees and they were challenging him with a really a ridiculous challenge about the afterlife, trying to see what Jesus would say about the state of people in heaven, trying to trip him up in his own doctrine. And he said that they erred, not knowing the scriptures. And then he said this about people who go to heaven. They neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels in heaven. The point being that angels don't get married. That's the clear implication of the passage. And when we go to heaven, we're going to be just like them in that regard, that there will be no marriage for us in heaven. And that has caused some consternation among some people, and, and we can understand why some people might be perplexed by it. Because marriage makes us so happy here on earth it seems so much a part of who we are to be fulfilled if we have a godly, righteous, and holy marriage. It makes us so happy to be involved in that marriage. And then we think about going to heaven and that integral part of who we are being taken away from us. And yet we've got to trust God. There are a great many things about heaven that we do not understand, about how God is going to make it so perfect. But it's going to be perfect. Because 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says it is a, a place that's incorruptible and undefiled and doesn't fade away. That word undefiled means there's nothing there to make it less than what it is. There's nothing there to weaken the joy that we will have in heaven. Re Revelation 21, 4 says that in heaven, God wipes away every tear from our eyes. Well, that's equally difficult for me to understand. How is God going to make it so that all of the difficulties that have come to us in life, which seem equally integral to who we are, that is, those have been formative challenges, some of those hard things that we've gone through that cause us tears and make us regret. How is God going to make it so that those things are just not any kind of uh, amount to nothing in our minds? There no aware, there's no awareness of those painful things. I don't know how God's going to do that, but do you believe God can do it, that He will do it, that regardless of what God gives or takes away when we go to heaven, that it will be just right for us? We need, I believe, in the church today, I don't mean at Lakeside in particular, but I just mean in the church in general, we need a greater anticipation of heaven. And maybe we need to trust God enough to say, I want to go there even if there are things about it I don't fully understand. I may get to where I'm so comfortable in this world that I don't really desire to leave it. But what does John say at the end of the book of Revelation? In the very last set of verses, he says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. There's a desire that Jesus would come back. Not that we have suicidal tendencies and want this life to be over, but we would be happy for the Lord to return, wouldn't we? Anytime Jesus wants to meet me, I want to meet him. Anytime Jesus wants me to take me somewhere that's better than where I am now, I'm ready for him to come. And we say that not treating this world lightly, not looking to this world and saying, God, you bless me with this world, but I don't care anything about it. That's not the attitude at all. It's not saying that we don't want to be married anymore. It's not saying we don't want to work for the Lord in this world anymore. It's not saying that we reject the offer of living in this world. That's not the point. It's we believe God when he says heaven is going to be better. 
and we're ready to go to heaven anytime he wants us to go to heaven. So, angels in heaven, neither married nor given in marriage. Number six, angels were involved in the giving of the law of Moses. And I don't know exactly what they did in the giving of the law, but in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, we read that it was ordained by angels. It was something about the old law was given by angels. And let's read about it in the book of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2. We're going to read through verse 4. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable... Wait a minute, that's the old law. This is going to be a comparison between the certainty, the unalterability of the law of Moses and the unalterability of the law of Christ. And the Hebrews writer is going to say the law of Moses was unalterable. Mankind could not fiddle around with it, make it teach whatever he wanted it to teach. Well, similarly, you can't do that with the law of Christ. If this weaker, lesser law in the Old Testament could not be altered, then do you think you're going to be alter, altering the law of Christ? And he says, certainly not. Let's read it together. If the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation that is through Christ? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. So here's one law, the old law. Here's another law, the new one. The difference highlighted here by the Hebrews writer is the old one was given by angels through the mediation of angels in some way. And then on the other hand, the law of Christ was given by Christ Himself, then the apostles and the inspired prophets. And the one given by Christ and his inspired apostles and prophets is greater than the one given by angels. But if you were to ask me, Caleb, exactly what did the angels do in giving the law of Moses? I would say, I don't know. Number seven. Angels at one time were, well, let's see. Let me say, let me say this. I, I don't want to miss any points. Number seven is that angels are or were ministering spirits or agents to carry out God's will on earth, ministering spirits. Look at chapter 1 and verse 14. Are you still in Hebrews? Most of our points come from Hebrews. Are they, that is the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? I don't know exactly what the ministration of spirits, these angels, would look like in our contemporary context. Because when we look to the Bible, all of the work of the angels in administering the affairs of the early church were done in the miraculous age and involved miracles occurring. And obviously from 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, we're not living in that miraculous age anymore. So I could not point to any event and say, aha, an angel did that. Or some success that I have in my life and say, an angel did that. But at the same time, I know that God's providence is active in the world today from Romans 8 and verse 28. So I would not doubt that angels could be involved in carrying out God's providence. But another thing needs to be said about this point, and that is the doctrine of guardian angels is an unbiblical doctrine. In Matthew 18 and verse 10, Jesus said that the angels of little children behold the Father's face in heaven. That's a true statement. But some have used that verse to teach that every little child has a guardian angel that protects him from any tragedy happening to him. But we know that can't be true. Because sometimes, unfortunately, tragedies befall little children, just as tragedies befall people of all ages. And so if we were to suggest that every little child has a guardian angel, then we would have to say that these angels are falling down on their jobs at some point. And obviously nobody wants to say that. There's no reason to think that they have the guardian angels to start with. We just know that whatever Jesus meant when he said the angels of these little children 
do behold the Father's face in heaven. He was saying something about these angels being ministering spirits or in some sense helping with people. But again, remember Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. We might be more curious about how these things happen than we actually have explanation for. Then number eight, angels at one time were capable of sinning. They could make a choice to rebel against God. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, we read that God did not spare the angels who sinned. Some angels sinned. The Bible says it plain as day. He did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and reserved them in pits of darkness for judgment, or kept them in pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So God is keeping these angels in custody for judgment. But they were the ones who sinned and were cast down. Jude 6 adds an interesting detail to this. And that is that these angels who sinned did not like to retain the position they had. They did not respect God's domain that God had given them. But they left it. They abandoned the role that God had assigned to them. So what was the angels' sin? Well, it seems to be that they were lifted up with pride because they did not want to stay in the domain that God had given them, but they abandoned it. And apparently the devil, this is number nine, apparently Satan is one of those angels and actually the leader of the angels who rebel against God. You might say, when did this happen? When did the angels rebel against God? I don't know exactly, the Bible doesn't say, but... It had to be before Eve sinned, didn't it? Because the devil came and enticed Eve to sin. So he was already rebelling against God by that time. And the devil, of course, later tried to entice Jesus to sin. So here he was living in rebellion against God. Someone might say, well, exactly what did he do? We don't have a play-by-play -play of what the devil did, but remember what 1 Timothy 3, 6 says in discussing the qualifications for elders. One of the qualifications is he must not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Well, that may refer to the condemnation that the devil will bring upon people in hell. Could be. But if you put 1 Timothy 3, 6 together with Jude 6, then it appears that the devil was condemned because he became prideful. And the warning about people who are novices being appointed to the eldership is, they might become prideful. So might we suggest that the devil was condemned? This would fit with the description of the angel's rebellion, that he rebelled and was condemned because he became prideful. Remember what Paul said to Timothy, a novice, a new Christian, should not be an elder because he might get lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation. One translation says the condemnation incurred by the devil. That's interpretive. That's making an interpretive choice, but it makes sense given what 1 Timothy 2, 4 and Jude 6 says about the rebellion of the devil. Okay, number 10, and finally. There is no plan of salvation or scheme of redemption for the angels seems to me that angels cannot choose to sin anymore because remember Revelation 21, 27 says that nothing unclean will ever enter into heaven. I'm not worried that when I get to heaven it's going to be messed up because all of these devils are going to be going around sinning and it's going to be troubling to me. Nothing unclean can ever enter it. seems that angels cannot make the choice to sin anymore. But when I think about the angels who did sin... The Bible says in Hebrews 2 and verse 16 that he does not give them any help. Let's read that passage together. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Those angels are kept under chains of darkness in reservation for the judgment of the great day, Jude verse 6 says. So they're already reserved for that judgment. They can't make a change about their spiritual situation. They're lost. But God does give help to the children of Abraham. Who are the children of Abraham? According to Galatians 3.26, we are all the sons of Abraham or the descendants of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. 
And verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The Christians are the children of Abraham in a spiritual sense. We're not the physical descendants of Abraham, but we have the blessings of the promise that was given to Abraham. Remember that back in Genesis 12, that through Abraham all the families of the earth would be blessed? Not just the Jews, not just the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. Well, who came through Abraham's seed? Jesus Christ did. And those who obey Christ who followed Christ in faith, are those who have put on Christ. They're the descendants of Abraham. And Hebrews 2.16 says, God gives them help. Can you imagine being an angel who had sinned? What a terrible situation that would be. Because there's no hope for you. No matter what you do. Even if you decide you hate the devil, nothing you can do about your spiritual situation. But what really, practically speaking, is the difference between the situation with angels who have no plan of salvation for them and a person who has the plan of salvation offered to him, the gospel's been extended to him. God is inviting him to come to heaven, but he rejects it. The end is all the same. Remember in Matthew twenty-five forty-one, Jesus portrays the judgment day and he says that the king will say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you what? You accursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. They're the ones who have no plan of salvation. You in this room tonight are the ones who have a plan of salvation. Will you take advantage of it? Or, on the day of judgment, will you be on the side of the devil and his angels? There are only two different kinds of angels. There are the holy angels who come with Jesus on the day of judgment, according to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. And then there are the demons, or the devil and his angels, in Matthew 25, 41. But that mirrors the situation with human beings, doesn't it? Because on the day of judgment, there are only going to be two categories of people. Those people who have neglected to obey Christ, who obey not the gospel and know not God, and those people, on the other hand, on the right side, as Jesus portrays it in Matthew 25, those people who are obedient, who have served God and their fellow man, those who are right with God. In which category are you? Do you need to obey the gospel? Do you need to be restored to faithfulness? Would you like the prayers of the church for some other reason? We would love to assist any of you in this room or watching online with obeying the gospel or being right with God. Come now, as together we stand and as we sing.
supper. It's been prepared in the elders' conference room for you. You may go now as we sing, Let the Beauty of Jesus. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Take the name of Jesus with you. Father, Lord, thank you so much for this circumstance you bless us with, that we're on this earth to serve you, and that one day we'll look forward to heaven. Thank you for the knowledge you've given us and the evidence that we have that those who study and really want to go to heaven and those who seek the truth will find it, and that we've all got hope, and that everyone else does as well. Please be with us as we depart, that with what we've learned tonight and the things that we learn as we fellowship with one another, that we can spread a good influence to others, that they may seek heaven as well, and that they can have a life with you. In your son's name we pray, amen.